What's up YouTube, I'm Guy. Today on the channel we're checking out the Omega Seamaster Professional or the SMPC or the Omega Seamaster Divers 300, a watch that apparently has many different names. This is the 2018 version of the Omega Seamaster. It's a watch that I have been eagerly wanting to get in my hands and bring to review. Today is finally the day. Not too terribly long ago, I reviewed the outgoing model of the Omega Seamaster Professional, the pre-2018 model. Then I also did a comparison video of that watch with the Rolex Submariner. In the comparison video, people said that I should have been comparing the Submariner to the new 2018 model. And while I agreed with them, it just wasn't a possibility at the time. The watch had been announced, but it wasn't widely available yet. I uh, certainly, I couldn't get one in my hands for review. Well, now that I finally have had the opportunity to check out this watch, I am also setting it down side by side with my Submariner and doing a little bit of a compare and contrast. You'll find that comparison more towards the end of this video. First, what I want to do is just review this watch. I want to talk about it in context of comparing it to the pre-2018 model, that outgoing or discontinued model. Before I get started with the review portion of this video, I need to extend a quick thank you to my friends over at Exquisite Timepieces. This watch is on loan from them. Exquisite Timepieces is a local authorized dealer of Omega and a number of other brands here in my Naples, Florida area. They're an outstanding store and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to have been working with them over the last several months. Big thanks to the guys at Exquisite Timepieces for loaning me this watch and supporting my YouTube channel. I really do appreciate it. If you'd like to learn more about them and what they have to offer, I highly recommend you go over to Exquisite Timepieces website, exquisitetimepieces.com, or give them a call. If you happen to call them out and talk to Evan or Tim or any of the other guys over there, let them know that you heard about their shop from Guy and the Just Bluefish YouTube channel. I know they would appreciate it, and I certainly would as well. A while back I did a comparison video of my Rolex Submariner with the pre-2018 Omega Seamaster Professional, and in that video it was mentioned over and over that I should have compared it to this watch, the 2018 model, because it is so uh, much more uh, technically superior to the older outgoing model and would compare more favorably to the, the Rolex Mariner. Well, at the time, these watches just weren't available yet. They had been announced, and uh, they just weren't flowing into the watch shops yet. So, now that we have it in hand, towards the end of this video, after I do my standalone review, I'm going to do a little bit of a comparison between these two watches and let you know what I think. Make sure you stick around till the end to see that, if you're interested in hearing my thoughts on how it compares to this Rolex Submariner ceramic. All right, YouTube, here we have it, the Omega Seamaster Diver 300M, also known as the Seamaster Professional or the SMPC, Seamaster Professional Ceramic. Reference number on this particular model, 210.30.42.20.2. This is, of course, the 2018 model, the newest iteration of the Omega Seamaster Professional Diver 300. We have it here on loan for review today. Of course, as, as you probably are well aware, I reviewed the prior generation of the Omega Seamaster 300M or Diver 300M, and I really liked that watch. So, one of the first questions you might have for me is how does this stack up to the previous generation? Well, right off the bat, I'll tell you that it is probably superior in every technical way that I can possibly think of. However, and yes, there is a however to amend to that statement. However, I do prefer, at least a little bit, that older version more than this one. Don't get me wrong, this is an outstanding watch, and again, technically superior in every conceivable way. But in terms of style and aesthetic, some of the new things that they've done on this watch aren't exactly blowing me away. Before we get into the actual review of this watch, let's talk about the differences between the new 2018 model Seamaster and the prior generation model. Now, first things first, this particular version comes in at $4,850. The previous identical version with the black dial and black bezel came in at 400 and or I'm sorry, $4,400. 
So 4850 versus 4400. There's a cost increase on this new watch of $450. I don't know if you're getting a whole heck of a lot for your money there. Certainly you're getting a much better movement, and maybe where that, um, perhaps that's where the bulk of the new expense comes from. But in all of the other differences about this watch, a lot of it is cosmetic. A few things about the bracelet that are nicer. Let's go into these differences, though. Number one, the new version, the 2018 version, is one millimeter or so larger in diameter. More shockingly, though, at least two millimeters in lug to lug distance longer, meaning that this new watch wears, in my opinion, significantly larger than the outgoing model. That might be a problem for some of you guys. It's certainly a problem for me, if I'm being honest. Other differences. The crown guards are reprofiled on the new model, and I think that that's a nice change. I thought the crown guards on the previous version looked a little strange. The helium escape valve is profiled differently on the new model as well. Six of one, half a dozen of the other in my opinion. I don't really care one way or the other on either of these. It doesn't matter. In, in, in all actuality, I'd probably prefer that they just got rid of the helium escape valve. The bezel graduations on the new ceramic bezel insert of the 2018 model, it's a little bit different, but uh, not good or bad. Just they seem to change it for some reason. A real striking difference, the ceramic wave dial on this new 2018 model. The old model was just a flat black, uh, actually I think it was a glossy dial, but uh, regardless, um, no texturing, no waves. This is uh, a ceramic dial with laser engraved wave pattern on the dial. I'll be honest, I'm not a huge fan of the wave pattern. They also moved the date to the 6 o'clock position on this new watch, and the uh, graduations on the chapter ring, or the seconds track outboard of the dial, is also a little bit different on this new watch. You'll notice that the handsets are a little bit different, broader hands on the new watch, in particular on the hour hand, and um, another major difference is an update to the bracelet and the clasp on this 2018 model. Finally, in this new 2018 model, we have a master chronometer caliber 8800 movement versus uh, caliber 2500, I believe, in the old model. And again, that new movement is a significant upgrade. This new 2018 Omega Seamaster Diver 300 is the 25th anniversary of the classic Bond Seamaster Professional, first appearing in James Bond films featuring Pierce Brosnan in 1995. This watch is somewhat of a reimagining of those watches, most in particular because we find, again, a wave dial pattern on this new watch. Now the wave pattern on this watch versus the wave pattern from those older watches is different. I'll bring up an image here. The older watches had a kind of tighter, busier wave pattern, whereas the wave pattern on this new watch is not quite as uh, uh, in your face. It is a little bit more subtle. It's a little bit more relaxed in terms of looking at maybe a wavy ocean. It's calmer. It's uh, less uh, choppy in the overall uh, amplitude of the waves on the dial. I do think that the new wave pattern on this 25th anniversary edition or version of the watch is preferable to those older watches. Uh, but in truth, I'm not a huge fan of the wave pattern, and I do like a plain, untextured dial more, which is one of the reasons why I prefer the outgoing, older model. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, the model from 2012 to 2017 didn't have any wave patterns. So if you were looking for a you know a nice Seamaster professional, but you did you wanted to get some, uh, one of the prior versions that didn't have that wave pattern, you'd be looking for a watch in those um, in that range of years of production. Basic features and specs on this watch: first of all, size, scale, dimensions: forty-two millimeters in diameter, twenty millimeter lug width, a thickness of about fourteen millimeter, and a lug to lug from one extremity of the case to the other, from tip to tip, or what I like to call a watch's wingspan. On my calipers, almost 50 millimeters, maybe 49 and a half. Now, in comparison to the older outgoing model, it's 
kind of significantly bigger. One millimeter in diameter, the old model was 41 as opposed to 42 millimeters in this case, but more striking, that lug-to-lug -lug distance. On the old watch on my calipers, it measured in at 47 millimeters back when I had that watch and reviewed it. And this one measures in at almost 50, for sure 49 and a half. So we're talking about a minimum of two, two and a half millimeters, maybe almost three millimeters longer in lug to lug. Uh, there's like a, a golden rule when it comes to wristwatches, and it generally has been lug to lug or wingspan no greater than 48 millimeters. Many, many, many watches follow that rule. It's a shame that this goes beyond that magical 48 millimeter lug to lug distance because I find it to be kind of unwearable on my six and a half inch wrist. It's one of the several reasons that I prefer the older outgoing model. This one is a little bit thicker as well, 14 millimeters in thickness. The old one I think was about 13. This new master coaxial movement, the 8800 that's in this is just a little bit thicker. I don't really have a problem with that particular dimension. Other features and specs on this watch, 300 meters of water resistance, screw down crown of course, also the helium escape valve up at the 10 o'clock position. We have a sapphire crystal with AR coating on both sides of the crystal and that crystal looks outstanding. Of course a unidirectional elapsed time bezel with ceramic insert and lacquer filled numerals and graduations. We also get a display case back which shows off that master coaxial caliber 8800 chronometer. We'll talk about that more in detail here. This master coaxial caliber 8800 is a very interesting movement, very high quality. We can see through this display case back that it has very nice, uh, what would you call that? Uh, kind of a wave pattern, Cote de Genève decoration. And uh, I think the screws are all black oxide and not blued, which is a nice touch as well. Despite the decoration though, a very high quality movement, 55 hours of power reserve, an interesting beat rate, 25,200 vibrations or beats per hour. All coaxial movements run at that particular rate, if I'm not mistaken. And of course, this is a 35 joule movement. What makes this most interesting, though, is that it is cased and metis tested. Metis or metas? Not sure quite how they pronounce that, but it is a testing procedure that meets and exceeds COSC chronometer certification in a number of ways. It is tested after casing, again, for power reserve, winding efficiency, water resistance, chronomatic precision in six positions as opposed to five, and of course magnetism, this being 15,000 Gauss magnetic, uh, amagnetic or anti-magnetic, I guess is how you would say. Uh, also in terms of that chronometric precision, uh, a METAS or METAS certified movement should be precise, if I'm not mistaken, from zero to plus five seconds per day. So uh, tighter tighter specifications than just simply COSC certification in terms of the accuracy or precision of the watch. It's also tested during the course of the entire power reserve, so tested at a full wind. I believe also tested at half power and maybe one third power if I'm not mistaken, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong down in the comments if you're 100% sure about that. Nevertheless, what we get is a good testing of the isochronism of this movement. There that is simply how well does it keep time throughout the entire curve of its power reserve. So overall, a very impressive movement and uh, certainly a big upgrade over the prior generation caliber 2500. The case design is a uh, typical Seamaster. There is some reprofiling, like I had mentioned, the crown guards. They're a little bit, uh, a little more elegant. They're not as uh, pointed. They are definitely uh, aesthetically better than the old version, in my opinion. The rest of the case, though, very, very similar. There might be some minor differences in terms of the overall arc of the lugs and uh, flattening of the underside of the lugs. But for all intents and purposes, you probably wouldn't notice much of a difference between the case of this watch and the old watch. In terms of fit and finish, it's absolutely outstanding, as has been my experience with almost every Omega watch. I guess I shouldn't even say almost, but in fact every Omega watch. They do fantastic finishing. The brushed and polished surfaces of the case all look outstanding. Now, of course, 
not exactly a part of the case, but since we're talking about the case, we do have this conical-shaped helium escape valve, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, it is signed with the um, uh, symbol for helium, HE, there. The helium escape valve shouldn't be on this watch, in my opinion. The purpose of the helium escape valve, of course, is for saturation divers, deep divers that spend a great deal of time underwater in pressurized tanks when they're not physically diving, and in those tanks you have a mixture of helium and oxygen. The point of this valve being that once they begin to come up from depth, the helium will be able to escape out from here instead of building up pressure and blowing out the crystal of the watch. The reason why I think that this shouldn't have any helium escape valve is because nobody is using this watch for that purpose. And maybe that's a little bit of hyperbole. Maybe if we look really hard, we can find one or two people on the entire planet that are in fact using this watch for deep saturation diving. To those people, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, buy a different watch. <laughs> that sounds a little uh, selfish, I guess, but why would we accommodate such a crazy small number of users for a, a feature that adds expense and, in my opinion, detracts from the overall aesthetic style of the watch? I would just prefer if they do erase it right off the case. We don't need it. That said, I will say that in person, it's really not that big of a deal. You almost don't even notice it. I could definitely live with it. If I bought one of these watches as my daily wear watch, sure, not a problem. I would get over it pretty quickly. Moving on from that helium escape valve, let's talk about the screw down crown here. Screw down crown is, I think, maybe reprofiled slightly in comparison to that old crown on the outgoing version of this watch. And, uh, I didn't have any problems with that crown, but this crown is excellent as well. Unscrewing it is very simple. We do, of course, have a hand winding movement, and it is hacking. So in the first position, we could set our date. In the second position, we stop the watch from running, and we could set the time as necessary. Now, screwing down the crown is super easy, very, very smooth. I have no problems with that either. One thing about this movement that I would like to see, or wish that they would have changed, I guess I... I can't say I'd like to see it change because I, they're not going to, but a lot of uh, Omega's master coaxial chronometer movements have a feature where when you pull the crown out to the first position, instead of being a quick set on the date, it's a jump hour, meaning that the watch continues to run, but you can adjust the hour hand independently. This is useful for if you're traveling between time zones, for example, and you don't want to lose the precision of your timekeeping so that the movement continues to run. The downside is on a watch with a date, you have to jump the hour 24 potentially times in order to increment the date up one or backwards to, 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 to decrease the date by one. I would probably say that, uh, that that's not a big deal and in my opinion would be preferable to... Uh, to, to just be having a quick set date functionality like this watch. I do like that jump hour function on some of the other watches. I think it's cool. The bezel on this watch is a pretty significant improvement in terms of function. Overall, using the bezel, the clicking detent is very, very smooth. Definitely better than the previous generation Seamaster. I think that the overall style or aesthetic of the bezel isn't my favorite, in particular because we have these faceted or scalloped outsides on the bezel and no real texturing or traction or knurling to get a good grip on it. Being as how it is so smooth to use though, we don't really need an aggressive grip. I think that I could, you know, basically have no problems manipulating this bezel even with wet or gloved fingers or hands. It works very good. I just, you know, I, I prefer a more traditional knurled or textured bezel edge, but yeah, it is done very well in terms of the overall functionality. The bezel insert is also nice. Of course, it's black ceramic, and I had to do a little research, but I believe that the numerals and graduations are lacquer filled, and it's really nicely done. It's highly legible. The type of uh, numerals and the graduations are a little bit different on this watch than the older outgoing Seamaster model. Is six of one, half a dozen of the other. They're both fine, in my opinion. There's no real particular reason why I would need it one way or the other, so no complaints there. I do really like 
the, the, the overall functionality of this bezel though, despite the fact that I do complain about the, the, the edge texturing, it's really not that big of a problem. And you know, aesthetically it's, it's nice, it's different, it's unique to say the least. It's distinctly Omega. Moving on from the bezel, let's talk about the dial, the wave pattern dial. First things first, as you can probably see, we have a date complication at the six o'clock um, position. It was originally on the older models at the three o'clock position. They've decided to relocate it for whatever reason. Uh, another one of those changes that's just kind of six of one half a dozen of the other for me. I don't really care either way. I think a lot of people are going to prefer the date complication down at six o'clock though. Maybe it's a little bit more aesthetically balanced. Uh, yeah, I could see that that is going to be an argument people would have, and I'd probably agree. Now, the date window isn't like framed or dressed up. It's not really nicely done. It's just kind of there, but it is legible, it's usable, and there's nothing particularly wrong with it. The dial itself, most striking, of course, since this is a ceramic dial, it does have these laser engraved wave patterns. I'm honestly just not a real big fan of the aesthetic there. I just like a straight black, untextured, undecorated dial. Uh, you know, that's just my personal taste. This is um, kind of an homage back to those original James Bond style Seamasters from the 90s and 2000s, all of those movies. So I do understand why they opted to, to go with this wave pattern. It's just not my preferred aesthetic. The rest of the dial is very nicely done, and you'll notice that it's very clear and legible through this outstanding sapphire AR-coated crystal. The crystal is just domed ever so slightly. Very, very, very high quality crystal. So yeah, the, the, the rest of the dial though, very, very nicely done. Very thick, beefy applied markers. You can uh, almost feel the depth. And if we look at it in profile side from the side here, you can just see how tall they stand off the dial. They are shrouded or surrounded in a metallic material. I'm afraid I don't know if that's white gold or stainless steel. Same with the handsets. Someone correct me in the comments, uh, or not correct me, but fill me in. I didn't find anywhere online on Omega's website if they specified stainless steel or gold applications on the dial and the handset. I would hope that it's gold at this price point, but I'm not 100% sure. Now, of course, we have the double baton marker at 12, batons at single batons at three and nine, and then a little abbreviated single baton down at the six, and then of course circle markers at all the other positions. A decent um, uh, chapter ring or seconds track outboard of the dial, although it is different than the old version. I think I prefer the old version. In terms of aesthetics, it's just a little bit more subtle and simple. This is um, a little bit more bold, I guess is one way to say it. Um, again, m not a big deal. It's just little things like this keep stacking up, and I say I kind of prefer the old way they did it better. Uh, the markers on this dial I think are a little bit larger, which is nice, more legible. I do like that they've increased the size of the markers. It seems slight though, I'm not 100% sure how much, but they do seem a little bit bolder. They most certainly increased the size of the hands. The hour hand in particular is much broader, maybe even a little bit longer than the hands on the outgoing pre-2018 model. The handset on this particular watch is outstanding. I do like this sword style handset with the skeletonized inner portions. Then, uh, you know, a basic seconds hand with a, uh, a lollipop luminous pip out at the end and a red tip, which matches up nicely with the Seamaster uh, logo below the Omega branding on the dial. And just a little hint of red there to mix it up. I think that looks great as well. Overall, it is a very nice dial, high quality, well implemented, very uh, well-appointed, luxurious, if you will. I just uh, yeah, kind of wish it wasn't the wave pattern for me personally, if I was gonna buy one of these watches. The bracelet also saw an update as well as the uh, end links. The end links on the old watch kind of were uh, an extended, whereas you can see that these are recessed and the first center links from the first link sit into them. So it's a little bit uh, backwards from the old watch. Nevertheless, extremely high quality. The links themselves, a little bit more low profile, a little bit more refined, somewhat understated. The links on the old style bracelet were a little bit more uh, 
curvaceous, a little thicker maybe, I do like this bracelet more. In terms of the overall aesthetic and style, still very much the same. It's not like you're getting a completely different type of bracelet, just a little bit more refined. The big difference is on the clasp. Now the clasp itself is quite similar, dual button trigger deployant, nice high quality swing arm, but what we find is the awesome uh, sliding lock or glide lock style adjustment system. I believe we have uh, six uh, positions of adjustability in, in the clasp and you can bring it out in uh, maybe two millimeter increments to find a preferable fit on the wrist. There's also, uh, and I'll be honest, I think it's pretty useless, but there is also a dive extension. So you get two types of uh, adjustability and, and then technically a third type because you have these small half links right here on the bracelet to get an even better fit. So half link on, I believe it's both sides of the bracelet, the diver extension here, and then the, uh, the glide lock system on the uh, inside of the clasp as well. So this clasp is absolutely 100% outstanding. I love it. That was one of my big complaints on the old version of uh, of the Seamaster. If I were to buy one of those, I would have had to have swapped out the clasp, which you can do. You can buy uh, these clasps directly from Omega and put them on your watch. So that's what I would have had to do. Otherwise, though, yeah, it's a, it's an outstanding bracelet. Very, 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 very big upgrade, very high quality. Obviously, if I didn't mention it, and of course you probably know, it is held together with a, a screw system. That, of course, is what you would expect for a bracelet of this caliber. Not exactly sized up for my wrist in terms of the bracelet sizing, but I can lay it on my wrist and give you guys a look at how it wears on my six and three quarter inch wrist. And I'm gonna tell you that lug to lug distance of about 49 and a half to 50 millimeters, it's, it's just too big. It wears too big for me. I know people are gonna say, oh, it's okay, it looks fine, whatever. I don't prefer it. That is why if I was buying a Seamaster, I would get the older pre-2017 model. It, it wears smaller, it wears more preferable for me. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if they have like a mid-size version of this watch yet. I know that they typically do that. And maybe in the future, they'll bring in like a 38 millimeter size. Maybe I would give that some serious consideration. But as of right now, uh, yeah, because of the size, mostly, this, uh, this would be something that I probably couldn't comfortably wear on the daily. Now, if you like a little bit bigger of a watch, if you got a little bit bigger of a wrist, this watch is outstanding. And again, as I said earlier, technically superior to the older model in pretty much every conceivable way. I really do like all of the technical specs. It's very, very impressively built, constructed, made, however you want to put it. Uh, just some minor style things that I don't like. And of course, size, scale, dimensions just doesn't work for me. All right, so what do we think in terms of the Omega Seamaster versus the Rolex Submariner? Well, I think that in a lot of ways, the Seamaster is a better watch than the Submariner. First thing, now that I'm thinking about it, let's look, let's do, bring in the Loom video. I did a Loom video and we'll compare that. In terms of Loom, they're virtually identical with two small exceptions. The hour, or I'm sorry, the minute hand and the luminous pearl on the bezel of the Seamaster are a slightly greener, different color. But the, uh, the rest of the dial and the handset in terms of the brightness, the coloration, I can almost not even tell a difference between the Rolex and the Seamaster. So I'll call it a draw, maybe with the slight nod towards the Seamaster in terms of loom, since we have those alternating colors on the, the Minus hand and the, and the Luminous Pearl. That said, what about the rest of the watch? Well, for sure, right off the bat, I can tell you that the crystal on the Seamaster is superior, so much better. It is outstanding. You can probably tell in the video here, the crystal on this Omega is just super, super clear. And there's a haze or a bit of glare always on your Rolex crystals. It's really a big downside for me. One of the things that I honestly don't like about Rolex watches in general. I believe that the big debate is probably going to be with the movement Rolex 3135 versus the Omega caliber 8800. A longer power reserve right off the bat on the Omega so that's a plus 55 hours versus um, 48 hours on the Rolex. Uh, in terms of 
which one is better, superlative chronometer versus Meta certified? I don't really know what kind of testing parameters the superlative chronometer goes through, but I think that in terms of how it's tested, maybe the Omega movement is uh, more rigorously tested. I'm, again, not 100% sure. In theory, it should be more anti-magnetic. I think that in all regards except one, I might give the nod to the Omega. And I'm not, I'm not super informed, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to say which movement is better. But here's what I will say. The one reason why I prefer the Rolex. It is a uh, superlative chronometer, meaning that they guarantee a plus or minus two seconds per day of accuracy tested to that precision after being cased. Whereas the Omega's 8800 is zero to plus five seconds per day. So I guess it's very close in terms of a, a four second deviation versus a five second deviation but I would be happier with something that was within two seconds either way than was five seconds fast, if those were my options. If someone said you could have a watch that's going to be five seconds fast or a watch that might be minus two, might be plus two seconds fast, I would take the minus or plus two because it's going to stay closer to accurate for longer, meaning you're not going to have to reset the time as often. That is why I give the nod to the accuracy and precision to the Rolex. Now, the Rolex also runs a 28,800. Some people are going to prefer that. Uh, this is uh, Omega's 25,200 vibrations per hour. Can you noticeably tell a big difference in the sweep of the seconds hand? I mean, I personally can't, but I know some people are going to say that that's what they prefer. They prefer the 28,800. Style and aesthetics, that's going to be a big one. Which do you prefer? Well... First of all, the size and the dimensions. I very greatly prefer the Rolex's size. Again, the, mainly the lug to lug, 48 millimeter lug to lug, almost 50 millimeter lug to lug on the Omega. It just, that it wears too big. 42 millimeters in diameter is not ridiculously large, but this 40 millimeters is just more comfortable on my wrist. It's basically a smaller package, despite all of the complaining that people say about the super case, in particular the bulkier lugs of the Rolex Oyster case. I mean, the, the, the Omega's lugs are bulky as well, in terms of like which one is bulkier or bigger. Honestly, to my eye, they're, they're sort of the same. Because this is sort of faceted, maybe it appears a little bit more streamlined or smaller, but in all actuality, I think they're about the same width. They're about the same level of bulk. So yeah, overall, uh, the, the size, the scale, I do prefer the, the Rolex. What about the rest of the aesthetics? I think that the Rolex is just simpler, it's cleaner, it's a little bit more understated. All of the graduations and markings on the bezel are bigger and more loud. Uh, I think that the, um, on the Omega, I should say, I think that it's uh, definitely a more showy watch once we start looking at the bracelet, simple three-link oyster bracelet versus this uh, five-link style. It's almost like a basket weave look or pattern to the Omega's bracelet. Again, the, the, the Rolex is just a little bit more understated, a little bit more elegant looking, in my opinion. I prefer that style. This is entirely subjective, of course, and there's going to be plenty of people that say they prefer one over the other. Either way, lots of people will say the Omega. Um, you know, it is what it is. I'm just giving you my two cents. I like the date magnifier on the Rolex as well. I can read that date from this distance perfectly. There's no question that it's the 22nd. The date on the Omega, a little bit harder to read with my eyesight. So yeah, a lot of people say I hate the wart on the crystal. It's so functional for me that I do prefer that. The bezels, the bezel action on the Rolex is better. The knurling or texturing on the edge, I prefer to the scalloped or faceted bezel. Uh, yeah, I think the action is a little bit better on the Rolex, but the, the action on the Omega is very nice. The old Omega versus the Rolex, it was a very big difference. These watches are very close. The Omega comes in at a much cheaper price point, so keep that in mind. That could be a big plus for some people. It's more widely available right now. Rolexes are hard to find. I think that uh, you're certainly not going to go wrong with either one of these watches. My preference is leaning towards the Rolex, of course, but if the Omega's uh, size and scale was cut back a little bit, it would be a very hard decision. 
in particular, once we start talking about the price difference, there is a whole lot more value in the Omega. There might be some technical differences that really do actually make it superior, but two outstanding watches. I like them both a lot. You really couldn't go wrong with either one. All right, guys, there you have it. There's the Omega Seamaster Professional, the 2018 model, the SMPC, or the Omega Seamaster Diver 300, whatever the heck you'd like to call it, there it is. Well, what do I think? I think if push came to shove, and I had to choose between this or the previous version, I would go for the previous version. This is certainly a more technically advanced watch, absolutely, without a doubt but they changed some things about it that I do not prefer. And the previous version was pretty outstanding in its own right. Yes, this one is much more technical in terms of the movement, without a doubt. The bracelet and the clasp of the new version is a significant upgrade. There's plenty of upgrades to go around, but in terms of the aesthetic and the style, the overall size and scale, the old one really, it hit the nail on the head for me. I think it was just about perfect. And the new one definitely misses the mark in a lot of those ways. Without a doubt though, technically superior. Nobody could argue that. It is an extremely high quality, well-built watch. I'm very, very impressed by it. So we talked about this watch versus the Rolex Submariner, and I think that the debate about which one is better has certainly got a lot closer. It used to be that, uh, in my opinion anyway, if we base it on the previous generation, the outgoing model or the pre-2018 model of the Seamaster, that the Submariner was by far and away a superior watch. That has been uh, significantly, I don't know, narrowed. The distance between the two, anyway, has narrowed significantly. I might even be able to be persuaded into saying that I think the Seamaster is technically a better watch. I think that might be the case. I'm not 100% sure yet. I've spent a lot of time with the Rolex Submariner and only a very little amount of time with the Seamaster. At a minimum, it's neck and neck, and there's a chance that, yeah, the Seamaster could be better. In terms of the overall style and aesthetic, though, for me, it's obviously the Submariner. I think the Submariner is more or less a perfect watch. It might be the perfect watch, at least in my opinion. If somebody wanted to say that they preferred the Seamaster though, I wouldn't think they're crazy. I completely understand why you might have that opinion. It's an outstanding watch in its own right. It's an outstanding value. It has that in spades over the Submariner without a doubt. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this review as much as I enjoyed producing it. Thanks for tuning in, as always. If you want to help support the channel, there's a number of ways you can do that. They're all listed down in the notes or the description of this video. You can follow me on my social media accounts, be it Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, whichever you prefer. You can support me on Patreon. A little bit goes a long way. A big thanks to everyone that has been helping me out on Patreon. Or you could shop on Amazon using my affiliate link. Down in the description of this and every video that I produce is a link to Amazon with my affiliate tag embedded in it. If you like something that I've reviewed and you're thinking about buying it or anything else for that matter and you want to go to Amazon and purchase it, think about clicking my link first. It definitely helps me out. I get a small commission with every transaction. Those commissions do add up. I really appreciate everyone that has been using my Amazon affiliate link. Thanks a lot guys. I really do again appreciate it. Well that's going to do it for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Until the next one, bye now.